Hi, welcome to the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. This is a special episode um, outside of the normal scheduling and slightly different. It's not an interview this time. So I guess it's episode 3.5 in a way. There's going to be another normal interview episode coming out very soon. Uh, but I just finished to taking care of this one, so I wanted to share it with you. I've already talked about this in my blog, but I was invited to speak at the European Planning Conference in Prague this year, a professional event gathering advertising, marketing, brand strategists, and planners from all over Europe. Uh, there were It was really a lot of fun. There were people from the Czech Republic, of course, from Slovakia, from Switzerland, from France, from the UK, from Sweden, from the Netherlands, from Belgium, so a little bit all over Europe, and from Macedonia, of course. Because uh, the event was organized by Christian Pitkowski, a friend of mine. He used to work for the publicist group, a uh, group of advertising agencies, well, communication agencies in Vietnam, while I was working for the same group for a company called Sachi and Sachi in Singapore. And I was on a business trip to Ho Chi Minh City a few years ago, and we met up then and had a few drinks together, spent a lovely evening. He showed me around Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, he's from Macedonia, and he moved back to Europe and started organizing this European planning conference a year ago. So this was the second edition. And uh, he's in the process of starting a new agency with his business partner, Jana. They're a really good bunch of people. I wish them uh, a lot of success with their new agency called Fiona Rosario. I'll add the link over to the show notes. It was a fun event. Uh, I've already written about it on my blog all, all over the place. So the next one's going to be next year, 2016. I recommend checking it out. I was the last person speaking of the two-day conference, and uh, my talk is about what strategic planners or strategists can learn from tabletop games. So really aligning one of a long passion, uh, personal passion of mine with uh, with my job. The only thing, I just want to apologize in advance for the quality of the recording. It's not amazing. Uh, I only had my traveling mic with me. It's good enough, but you can hear it's not, it's not perfect, and as soon as I turn my mouth away from the mic and from the audience to look at a slide. You can hear it, but uh, it, it's still okay. So I'm, I'm planning to get better recording equipment for Christmas this year. Uh, the talk was also followed by a Q&A session, but the quality to record the whole room wasn't good enough to keep, so you just have the main presentation. Uh, I'm also adding the slides from the presentation on SlideShare and copying them on the show notes on my blog. Uh, they're not necessary to understanding the talk, really. There's just a few images, so you don't really need them. Uh, but without further ado, here we go. Okay. All right, so let's start with a little bit of an intro. Um, so as Chris said, thank you, Chris, by the way, thank you for organizing this event. It's really such a privilege to be talking to fellow planners. I always have like a lot of pleasure talking with different planners and, and people in my industry and as we were talking about over lunch, it's like a lot of different people with a bunch of different interesting backgrounds and interesting stories to tell. Um, so just quickly about myself, I, uh, I, um, my name is Willem, Willem Van Der I have a very Dutch name, an American accent because I was born in the States. I grew up in France, I'm more French than anything. My father's Dutch and my mom is Spanish. Uh, and uh, work-wise, I started out in design. I worked for several years after that in coaching and training and development with a company called Landmark, and then moved on to planning uh, with an agency called Iris in London. My background is in digital marketing, particularly, but I don't really think of myself as digital. I think I'm a jack of all trades because I've been working on a bunch of other projects since then. Uh, I went to travel around Asia and I worked with a variety of clients while in Asia, and then got to work with Sachi and Sachi in Asia. So more on the traditional TV side of things. Uh, then we're for an agency called Possible in Singapore. was heading the strategy team for uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, last year I came back to Europe because I really like its old stones and this is where I grew up. And so at the moment uh, I've started my own thing. I'm freelancing and the name of my company is Ice Cream for Everyone. Uh, the website is right there. So for a bit of promotion, I'm always looking for new clients and new work. Uh, but also, more importantly, I started writing a weekly newsletter or that I send out with, like, it's got a whole story every week that I write, like, between a 1,000 and 2,000 words. And I've started an audio podcast where I interview people I'm interested in. Among other people, I started interviewing game designers, which is one of the, the um, that gave me a bunch of material for doing this talk in the first place. And I'm interested in games. And uh, uh, when Chris invited me to speak, I thought it'd be a cool soft topic to talk about tabletop games in particular. Uh, but I was also very conscious once I saw the lineup that I was the very last speaker in the whole conference. So 
after two days of conferencing, I thought it might be worth talking about dessert. Because that's how you end a meal. Uh, which is a French word, by the way, dessert. From the word desservir, which means to clear the table. Once everything is done, we've got all the main courses, we clear the table. And we usually finish with something sweet, which can be an ice cream, by the way. Uh, in this case, a good mix of them, because for future rolls, we've got ice cream in the middle, dough around them, mm -hmm. and chocolate on top, which is a good combination. Um, but the main thing, I've read a couple of articles about it, and the effect of sugar at the end of a meal is that it relaxes your stomach, so that even if you've had a really heavy meal and you've had a lot of food, it relaxes your stomach to allow for a little bit more food to come through. So maybe after two days of like heavy talking with your brain, I was thinking that this talk, like I thought, okay, so if we move our heads a little bit, if ever you feel you're too full, there's too much going on in your brain, you just like shake it a little bit, not too much, a little bit, and make a bit more space for this talk, basically. Um, then another thing about dessert. Last week I was watching, I was with my brother. My, my brother's a chef and he lives in London and uh, he loves watching MasterChef. Everybody knows Master, MasterChef, right? He watches the Australian edition, particularly. He says that, that one's the best. Uh, he's, he's more of a Michelin star, so I trust him. I don't know why, but. And I was watching that episode last week where all the contestants, you know, they're like cooking this competition. There are two different teams and the goal was to create desserts. And each team had to come up with five different patisseries or desserts. And the person that won, and it's all a great photo, but the thing that won, I mean, the, the team that won one of the five desserts was this chocolate popsicle. And so it was a, a creation that basically came on a stick, like a popsicle, and you had a hard, bitter, dark chocolate outside, so that you could see the judge pick it up, but they were kind of being careful because inside is a, a creamy milk chocolate uh, that was all kind of frozen, but it's heating up at the ambient temperature, so they're being careful as they're picking it up, cracking into it, and you could hear the noise, and the, the smile on their face between the mix between the bitter chocolate and the creamy milk chocolate on the inside, and then the surprise ingredient that was popping candy. Fizz waves or pop rocks, do you remember that? That like that you had on your tongue that kind of fizzles and you can kind of hear it outside your ears and inside and it's fun, it's tangy, and you can see everybody smile, like all the judges had a smile on their face. And that's why I'm talking about this, is that it's the one ingredient and the one dessert that was the most playful that won all the judges. The one that they said reminded them of their childhood memories. And that's the reason I'm bringing it up is because we all play. All mammals, it's like natural and instinctive, we play to learn, right? Um, and it's arguable that, I mean, maybe as a really complex mammal that have created complex societies and a lot of different things to learn, we've also created games that are more and more complicated to be able to learn all the things around us in our society. It's not necessarily the truth, but it's just a way of looking at things. What's for certain, anyway, um, there's, there's a lot of different definitions to games, so I wanted to start there. And there's eight main points I want to go over that I think planners can learn from games. It's like pretty broad, but and I'm going to go over like a bunch of different tabletop games that I enjoy. Uh, this one is from a, a sociologist, French, again, we might as well stay there, the French people. Um, Roger Caillois, uh, with a book called Les Jeux des Hommes, Game and Men, Games and Men. Uh, there's a lot of people that discuss what a game is. The definition is not necessarily agreed. It's an ongoing discussion, right? But he says that a game is an activity that must have the following characteristics. Fun. The activity is chosen for its light-hearted character. It's separate, circum circumscribed in time and place. So if you take, for example, a simple one, like a sport, football, it happens around a field, and it's circumscribed in time, and it's circumscribed in 90-minute time. It's uncertain. The outcome of the activity is unforeseeable. You don't know what's going to happen. Non-productive. Participation doesn't accomplish anything useful. So this is what I'm kind of slightly arguing, because at the same time when you play, you learn something. But it is true that when you're doing the game, you're not producing food, you're not producing essential things, right? But it, it's useful afterwards. Uh, it's governed by rules. So the activity has rules that are different from everyday life. So back to football. I'm not a football expert, but in life, it's not necessarily the case that you suddenly decide that the most important thing right now is we take this ball and put it over there in the net. 
And you can't use your hands. You just have to use your feet. So, like that. Uh, it's also fictitious. It's accompanied by the awareness of a different reality. So just as I've explained, like it's, it's not true that the ball is more important in the net than in the middle of the field. We just made it up, right? So it's awareness of a different reality. Um, so talking about different categories of games, games have been around like for a very, very, very long time. The first, some of the first board games that have been found in ancient Egyptian burial sites have been dating back to 3,500 before Christ. So 3,500 years before Christ, which is a, one of the games called Senna. Uh, and this represents a whole category of games, of games that are very popular, that are generally under the name of abstract strategy games. Abstract strategy games, yes. Uh, chess. I'm going to talk about chess because everybody knows about chess. There's a few different variants of chess that have evolved over the course of time, but we're still playing with the, the, the modern version right now. Uh, and what is what defines an abstract strategy game is one, the fact that you've got all the pieces on the board. There's nothing random or nothing hidden. Okay. Uh, and two is that there. Um, what is there? <laughs> the sun will be I forget it. I'm not very good with the chess part of things. Sorry, I've just had a whole list. There's another point. I'll come back to me. Uh, my father's, my grandfather is very, very good at chess. I'm not very good at chess. So this is all like stuff that I've learned on Wikipedia and a few websites while I was studying for this thing, coming up to the games I know more about. But uh, I think they're very, very interesting to be able to learn objective, uh, situation, strategy, and tactics. So the first, the objective. The objective of the game of chess is always the same. I mean, it's first winning the game, but there's only one way you do that is by taking your opponent's kingdoms, right? It's pretty simple. You can look at it any way you want. And the reason I'm saying this is, I know it's happened to me sometimes as a planner to look at a client brief and decide that actually they don't have the right objective. Whereas most of the time, really, the objective is somehow selling more of the stuff that they're doing, one way or another, right? You can say it in a more fancy way, but that's what's going on. What changes, however, is the situation of the pieces on the board. And uh, when you start a game of chess, you start at the beginning. Unfortunately, when we start working with a brand, most of the time it's like picking up a game of chess in the middle. You have to figure out where the pieces are and how you're going to be winning. Um, and uh, so that's analyzing the situation. You look at all the pieces and where they are at the board, and I think this is kind of akin to specifying what the brief is about, understanding what's going on in the market or with the audience or with competitors or what's the brand done in the past, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, so you define the situation. Then from there, you work out the strategy. Strategy is only available to people who have a lot of experience. People who don't have a lot of experience with chess, like me, are the only thing available are tactics. So strategy and tactics are always intertwined. They're related with one another. So it's like two faces in the same coin, right? Strategy is usually talked about in abstract strategy games in particular, but it's also the same thing for us pretty much, which is it's a long-term plan or idea. It's, for example, in chess, one, like, a beginner strategy, once you know enough about the tactics, the tactics are, like, basically how the individual pieces move, right? As strategy, you have to think about many, many different moves in advance. So, for example, it could be controlling the middle four uh, squares of the board, because from the middle four squares of the board, you have the most mobility to be able to attack your opponent. So, like, you know, you can look over the course of X number of moves, many of them, I want to try to control the board this way. Uh, and this is going to give me the most advantage of my, my opponent. But you also have to react to what the opponent is doing, and that means changing your tactics from time to time on a regular basis, right? So I, I think that abstract strategy games is one of the things that we're, we're allowed to, well, we can practice. I mean, there's a lot of different things you can practice through chess, but logic and reasonable, uh, reasoning and spatial thinking and etc. But coming up to something simple on objective, situation, strategy, and tactics is quite useful. Uh, I don't really have any numbers. There's another thing I, I saw that was quite interesting at some point that uh, a lot of people who play chess for a long time tend to live longer. I only have one number to back that up. My grandfather's 94. <laughs> uh, and he travels. He's just coming back from his second transatlantic cruise trip this year. Um, now moving on to another thing. This is a photo of uh, one of the biggest uh, gaming events in the world. Um, now we're talking about what's commonly called the hobby gaming market. Hobby games are like tabletop board games, collectible card games, role-playing games, miniature war game figurines, all of that <laughs> comes together. 
And uh, this is a, an event called GenCon in the States. There's two two large events. The big, the biggest two. One is in Essen in Germany. It's called the Spiel, game in German, and the other one is GenCon. And these games have been making a comeback these past few years. They, for a while, we were wondering if it, they're just going to die uh, a slow death, and it's just a thing for like you know geeks in the side, and nobody cares about them. But these past few years, they've been growing. The category has been growing 20% year on year. It's still, it's not much compared to the video games industry, but they've been coming back, like they're nowhere near dead. And these, these events have been breaking their attendance records every year. The, this one for the past six years has been breaking its record, like growing at 10, 20% more attendance every year. Uh, and one of the main things leading that is online crowdfunding. Kickstarter in particular, I mean, well, Kickstarter, I was able to find some numbers. In terms of the market, it, it was estimated in the U.S. and Canada to be about $880 million uh, in total. So it's not a huge market, but it's growing 20% a year. The other thing that's interesting is, is the number of games that have been uh, funded online. The total in Kickstarter, so since Kickstarter started in 2009, these games have raised $196 million. Uh, for a total of uh, 3,870 games, 93% of the projects that were funded were completed. So, like, you know, people didn't lose their money and went to fruition. And it's interesting to compare it with video games on Kickstarter. All video games projects since 2009 have raised 178 million with an 85% completion rate, 85% completion rate. So, it's funny to notice that, at least on Kickstarter, analog is beating digital. Um, now I want to talk a little bit more about these kind of games, which is cool because it's the European Planning Conference, and these are what's called European-style games, or German-style game board games as well, uh, with titles like Settlers of Plateau. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. Ticket to Ride. These games are they usually they come on boards, right? They have strategy elements that are quite simple. They have usually an element of chance, so that might come in dice rolls, it might come in card shuffling, uh, and they're usually balanced in such a way that all players have significant actions and choices to make from beginning to end of the game. And it's really difficult to figure out exactly who's winning until the end. So unlike a game like Monopoly, where arguably you, know, you really have very little choice, the choice you have in Monopoly is roll the dice, if you're lucky, you'll win, basically. Whereas a game like uh, the most celebrated is called Catan. And Catan is a, it's what's called a resource settling game. You know Catan, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, yeah, there you go. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, this is like the most famous one of the whole category. It sold 18 million copies. There's a bunch of articles. Every time there's articles on the board game renaissance, like they talk about Catan. It, was, it came out in 1995, and it's won like all the awards imaginable in the gaming industry. And, uh, and they call it, you know, Wired's called it the Monopoly Killer and stuff like that. So it, what's interesting is it promotes coll both collaboration and competition and strategic choices. So the point of the game is you're settling this island called Catan. It's made of hexagonal pieces that are shuffled and mixed around so that the board is never the same. It's always different. Each one of those areas represents one of five resources. There's like wood and ore, and there's like five different ones. Uh, and you players need combinations of those resources to be able to build stuff, a port, a road, uh, to, so to make their settlements. The thing is, from turn to turn, everybody's going to get different resources. So from turn to turn, you're going to need to either collaborate, exchange, or compete with different players at every turn. And, uh, and, and try to compose with everything. And you can't just hoard or create a monopoly. It's not possible. If you do that, you'll lose. Um, and the point of the game is to win 10 victory points. And the first to reach that wins. And how you reach those points is a combination of different things. Like the person who's got the longest road built might win a point. Or the person who's like collected the most of that particular resource might win a point. So it's made in such a way that it's very balanced. And there's a lot, many, many, many of those games, right? Uh, another interesting trend lately that I've noted was, uh, or is, uh, collaborative board games. This is a board game called Zombicide. One of the interesting things is that these games, there's a, you know, the whole trend for the zombie apocalypse? And there's a lot of these collaborative board games that have been just living onto that. Like this, this one called Zombicide, there's another one called Dead of Winter, another one called Pandemic, where you're all 
uh, working to prevent a giant epidemic around the world. The fun of this one is that as opposed to normal games where everybody's competing with one another, you're working together against the game. So each one of these guys around the table is playing a particular character. Anybody, I mean, you've seen The Walking Dead or at least heard of it, right? So you can imagine being the team on The Walking Dead and your mission is basically survive and kill zombies. Each one of the people around the table have a character that has different skills, different strengths, different weaknesses. And the only way to survive the zombie onslaught is to work together and create strategies to work together against the zombies. So obviously, one interesting parallel then, you know, we work in uh, teams of people that have very different skills in agencies. And there's all this often talk of, you know, team building exercises and stuff like that. And I, I, I mean, I tend to be cynical sometimes and I know that you hear team building, you're not too sure about what you're going to get. You kind of get cynical. Whereas if you say, hey guys, let's play Zombicide, we're going to kill zombies. And it happens in the process of it, which is one of the pleasurable things about games is you're learning and practicing and having fun at something without really realizing it's essential. Huh? You get by and Clients and zombies. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That was on purpose. Um, okay. Now, I'd like to talk about a, this, this is the last, but it's like the biggest where I've got a bunch of lessons because I think it's the full package and it's really my favorite kinds of games. Uh, and I participate in an audio podcast, another one in French, where we talk about the theory of these kinds of games that are role playing games. Tabletop role playing games. That, it's one of the most recent forms of games, frankly. They are the short definition for people who don't know. Uh, there's a lot of different definitions and people arguing about what that kind of game is as well. But the main thing is, I would say they're collaborative storytelling game. Okay? With one person that takes on the role of what's called the storyteller or the game master or the dungeon master. And that person uh, knows all the rules of the game and the universe inside of which everybody else is evolving. And everybody interprets a character. In the same way that, you know, when you're kids and you're playing cops and robbers or pretend or playing house, you're doing that. Or a grown-up version actually is, um, like mock trials or the model United Nations. Model United Nations, you've got people taking on the role of being the ambassador of the Czech Republic or France and they have goals and they have to work towards them. Uh, and I thought I'd give you a short example actually. This is Prague at night. This is where you're in Prague right now. So if you imagine, being at night, and you've got an event that you're attending professionally, and you've just been out with colleagues and in a restaurant at night, it's cold outside, but it's been really, really warm inside, you've had a bunch of beers and been drinking, having this kind of rich, meaty, braised meaty food from Prague, everybody's having fun, there's a dude with an accordion that came around, people laughing and singing, and now it's time to go home. So, you know, kind of putting on your coat to brave out the cold, it's just started snowing, you're shivering a little bit, but a little bit tipsy, so you don't really care about the cold that much. Uh, you got like, it's, there are a couple of snowflakes that are falling onto your lips and you're feeling the cold and shivering, walking slowly, slowly around the little dark streets that are winding down and the slippery cobblestones. And there's these lights, you know, the like yellow kind of old lights that are casting these weird shadows. Shadows are moving around like, and you're paying attention as the group of people is moving around, you're paying attention to these shadows, and you're hearing these bells of churches in the distance. And all of a sudden you hear a scream, a human scream or a shriek or something, and a bottle of shadows, or something like glass anyway. It echoes throughout the cobblestones. And you suddenly walk around. Instinctively, you kind of rush down a sword towards this alley where it comes from. And out of the corner of your eye, you see maybe a shadow or a tail or something kind of disappears around the corner of this alley. And you kind of feel and smell this acrid smoke that's really kind of burning your lungs. And you notice, like, looking down towards the floor, a body with a shredded coat and broken glass and something red, like, kind of winding, maybe blood or maybe wine, or you're not sure exactly what it is. What do you do? And that's how a role-playing game goes. It's a conversation that starts, I, as the person, like, creating this, this, um, this universe, I kind of describe everything that way, and then you play your character, and little by little, we're going to create a story together. Uh, so, this is all I've described. It sounds great. Now, around the table, it generally looks like this. <laughs> 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 
So, and it looks exactly like we are right now, around tables and talking, essentially. Uh, and there's a, what I love as well, there's a lot, there's just any stories that have been in, imagined by people exist in role playing games. There's all the major movies, there's you know, Star Trek and Mage, and you can play tragedy or high adventure, comedy, romance, like just about anything you could imagine is available there. And there's a few different things I pointed out out of that. One is you're playing around with numbers. You're playing with data, and that's one thing that you practice with role-playing games, more or less. But generally, given you're evolving in a particular universe, there's rules that govern it. And you have dice to say whether you're going to be succeeding or failing at actions. And of course, like if you're playing, say, musketeers, like in a more high adventure, like a swashbuckling, you're the three musketeers, or you're like in the movie The Princess Bride, and you're heroes that are saving a damsel in distress, and you're killing 20 people at a time with your sword, the rules won't be the same as if you're trying to simulate a horror uh, where you're all going to be you're pursued by this monster inside of an old house, and you have to escape. So different rules to different games, but every time you're playing around with numbers, and I think that's been particularly helpful and relevant, where uh, you're working with data to shift, shift through and looking for an insight and trying to figure out Excel spreadsheets as a planner, because it happens to you. Another one is speaking with an audience. Again, a game, a like role-playing game might look like this, but you are living through and interpreting and performing in a way, it's not, it's not acting, but you are speaking for an audience in the same way and working with other people in the same way that you might have to speak at a client meeting, you might have to speak at a pitch, you might have to couldn't like work with your other colleagues. So I think it's something that really, really helps with that. Uh, and another one, which is uh, inside of that, and so this is something that's that you learn in storytelling, like traditional classic storytelling, which is calling on to the five senses. So I think it's, we work with very often with very visual means in advertising, right? So we tend to, or at least I tend to, focus on what we're looking at and focus on what we see. And, and I think PowerPoint, we've done that too much as well. We focus on letting people read that. Uh, sometimes there's opportunities to bring other senses within play. And that's part of the reason why I'm describing the dessert and part of the reason why I'm describing like I think smell and what you hear, because they can bring products or, and client products to life in a specific way. Because, you know, some of them might actually be really, really important and emotionally it's compelling to talk about the five senses together. Uh, another area is uh, story. So, as in, that means improvising as well as writing solid stories, beginning, middle, end. That's one of the things that we were supposed to, I think we're supposed to do, that we do. I mean, uh, Chris, you said that last year in the conference there was a lot of people talking about storytelling, and I know it's a current buzzword around planning right now. But... Uh, one thing is that we're hardwired. We notice immediately what's gone wrong with the story. We kind of know when something is jarring and when something doesn't work inside the story. So it helps, I think, working through these kind of narratives and this kind of games helps you also, or at least helps me, with my briefs and my presentations to go through a flow that's going to be making sense and be interesting. You seen this movie? It's a lot of fun. Called Knights of Badass Dome, uh, with people playing live action role playing games. So that's another thing. So you can play around the table, but you can play live action. Um, and what I wanted to put as a point here is stepping into somebody else's shoes. When you're interpreting a character, you're developing empathy for that character in a certain way. Just like we're supposed to, I mean, planning was created in the first place to bring consumers into the process of advertising. So all the time we're making up and trying to imagine how it might feel and what choices somebody that is in a different audience than who, what we are, who we are. Uh, and what kind of choices they might make. And, and Tom, with your talk about behavior yesterday, that's something that like, came through as well. So you're playing at exercising yourself and exercising your empathy and imagination as to what it might mean to be in somebody else's shoes. Another one is working together. So I mentioned that with collaborating uh, in uh, board games, but it's also true of role-playing games. Role-playing games are teams that work together. So the person storytelling presents challenges to them, but everybody has to work together. Your character might have individual goals, but what's more important, ultimately, the goal is to have a fun time together. Ideally, I would say create a good story. Some people might disagree and there's different ways of playing the game, but I think it's really, really important that you develop collaborative problem-solving skills. Last point, it's fun. <laughs> Quite simply, I really like this thing I found online with this quote, I'll just read it out from Antoine de saint exupéry it is in the compelling zest of high adventure and of victory and the creative action that man finds his supreme joys. 
Um, so yeah, summing things up, eight points, objectives, situations, strategies, tactics, logic, reasoning, and creativity, playing around with numbers, speaking with an audience, writing and improvising solid stories, uh, stepping in somebody else's shoes, collaborative problem solving, and having fun. That's it. Thank you. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of the podcast. The next episode will be back to the regular interview format, so you won't have to listen to me for so long. Uh, if you're, by the way, if you're interested in having me come and speak at an event or a conference, uh, it could be marketing, advertising, or even gaming related. I'd love to be invited to a gaming conference. Uh, please keep in touch. My details are on the main website. That's www.icecreamforeveryone.net. Everything spelled out, icecreamforeveryone.net. You can always reach me on Twitter. The handle is at HippoWill. Uh, drop me an email or send a tweet on the Twitters. Uh, you can also keep in touch with me, of course, with the weekly newsletter. If you're not signed up to the newsletter, you should sign up to Ice Cream Sundays. Get a different story in your inbox every Sunday. And, uh, of course, there's always the podcast, which you're already listening to right now. So, until next time, have fun. Bye-bye. <laughs>